first started, we first offered a total poetry chapbook competition approximately 12 years ago. And um, we were hoping to make it self financing um, because nothing happens, even in the arts, without money. We want to be able to pay everybody who's involved uh, for, their, for their time and their efforts. Um, so it didn't really. It didn't pay for itself on that occasion. And we tried it again two years later, and it didn't work on that occasion either. But somehow in the last four or five years, there's been uh, great interest in the chapbook as a format, um, or pamphlet as, as, as it's called in England. The, the American term is, is becoming more prevalent here in Ireland. Um, that there, there are many competitions, the Poetry Book Society has started offering uh, choice selections for chapbooks. Uh, chapbooks are being seriously reviewed now in a way that they were kind of dismissed as not quite books before. Um, so this, and people are recognising that a chapbook can be um, a very uh, essential and important stepping stone um, Further their, their literary career, especially for, for a debutante. Um, but, but somebody like Matthew Sweeney, who's 13 full collections, last year he published two chapbooks, the year before uh, a chapbook. So it's not just beginner poets who, who choose to publish in this, in this format. So on the pre two previous occasions, how it worked was. Um, I trawled through the entries, selected a short list, and, and, the first two, and handed it to a single judge who was the editor, the current editor of Southbury at the time. Um, when I uh, resuscitated, or when I brought the competition back last year, again I chose the short list, uh, but the winners were determined by um, current poetry editor of Salisbury and three uh, prior editors. So we have, we have a panel of four editors, uh, four poets with experience, uh, experienced as poetry editors deciding on the final winner. We also have one little quirk in that while we have uh, two people published as a result of the competition, at least one of them must be a debutante because it, we think it is important uh, to make space for the, the debut of the poet in a competition like this. Um, if we didn't have that stipulation, there is the chance that um, experienced, well-published poets might, you know, might win the competition all the time. But having said that, the two poets chosen last year were, were both debutantes. Uh, there were, and there were entries from people who had full collections published, but they didn't. They didn't win, so it's, it's an interesting process. Now, in many book competitions, you get the jury around the table and they, they argue the toss. But again, something that's different about, about our approach is um, the, four fine, the four judges who decide the final winners, uh, I just get them to score each manuscript out of ten. Um, they have no idea what, how the other judges are voting, so they're, they're not in a position to vote strategically. So they score out of 10, basically, whichever manuscripts score the highest. And again, because the, we, we didn't have to do this this year, but it, if there's a, because of the quirk of one, one of the chapbooks has to be by a debut, if two top scoring manuscripts have been entered by each by poets who are not debutantes, then it's the highest of those two that gets to be published, and we go down the list to the highest scoring debutante. As it turns out, uh, Tanya Hirschman was a clear second place this year, and uh, we didn't have to do that. So it is interesting how, uh, how successful the debutante poets are in this competition. Um, Fool for poetry. You know, how did you get a stupid name like that? And I said because I gave it the name. And you know, many of us know that poetry is called the mug's game. 
but I also was aware of the you know the phrase "fool for love," and the implication of that that phrase is that uh, you know there's a certain naivety and acknowledgement that it isn't always a profitable uh, uh, enterprise to be involved in love, and it's the same with poetry, and you have to be really committed and at the same time almost aware of the drawbacks of being involved in this this pursuit, so that's why it's a food for poetry competition. Um, so, two winners this year, Victor Tatner and Tanya Hershey. Tanya is the debutante, as we've already said, but in a way she isn't because she's had two books of fiction published already. Um, and it's um, pretty unusual to see somebody crossing the union demarcation line between <laughs> fiction and poetry, but uh, Tanya has successfully done it. Uh, but Tanya is, is, is very well known in the, in the short fiction world, um, not just for her own writing, but uh, the marvellous uh, conduit of information she is for other writers on opportunities for writers and, uh, and, and news. And, and uh, benevolent gossip and all that. <laughs> so Tanya is going to read for us first from her. Thank you, Pat. Um, let me know if you can't hear me, but generally I'm quite good at projecting, so I thought I'd leave the microphone to one side. It's really, really wonderful to be here. This is all very moving to me because the way that things have come together, it's a very interesting confluence of events. Ireland, and Cork in particular, and the Munster Literature Centre, in, really in particular, have played such a huge part in my writing life. It, it was here in 2008 at the Frank O'Connor Short Story Festival that I did my first ever reading event a week after my first short story <coughs> collection came out. Um, and since then I've been back several times to the Short Story Festival, which felt like which felt like home to me. It was like summer camp for short story writers. And so it's really, and the fact also that my dad and my stepmother live here in Ireland and they're here today, which is just a wonderful thing. So it seems like the perfect way, as Pat was saying, for me to cross that very <coughs> scary demarcation line. And um, I have been moving very slowly towards poetry for years, but I was terrified of poetry. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at school. Um, it feels like a sort of, Poets Anonymous Confession Time, but I was quite scared of it and I did not understand the line break at all. I didn't get it, so I've been moving towards it very slowly and getting little bits of validation here and there from editors choosing to publish these things, which I didn't know whether they were poems or not, but I couldn't really have asked for a bigger boost of confidence than to win second prize in this competition. And when Pat called me, I cried. And uh, so I want to say thank you so much to the judges of this competition um, and to hear about the judging process makes it even more special that they, they definitely think these are poems. <laughs> and so I can't really say anymore that I'm not a poet or I'm trying to be a poet. And it's just, it, holding this, we only saw these today, so I'm in that first flush of complete hysteria about it. <laughs> but it just means so much to me and thank you so much to Pat and Jen for everything you do for the short story writers and poets. It's just wonderful to be here and before I get into some of the poems I wanted to say as well that I dedicated this book to my dad which he didn't know because um, I haven't let him see it yet and my dedication is that um, he taught me how to do the cryptic crossword when I was young and it turns out for me making a poem is a lot like solving a cryptic crossword so thank you dad and I hope you enjoy some of these and now I'll get onto the poems um, as a short story writer, I'm not so good at that pre-poem preamble, so we'll just see how it goes. So I'm going to read you about six or seven, they're all very short. And this one is called Dreams of a Tea Cellar. I sell you teas, Lapsang Souchong and Darjeeling, Oolong and Lady Grey. But I want to be a builder. I want to mix cement, fuck the scent of bergamot, the steeping and the straining. I want to lay foundations for the tallest buildings and the smallest houses. I want to wear builders' trousers and a hard hat. I want not to be fat and sat amongst the kettles, but sleek on building sites, 
with the foreman and his crew, muscled and unbowing to any customer. I want to swing from a girder, dropping my teapots one by one from 60 feet while drinking builder's brew. <laughs> too milky and too sweet for you. <laughs> Uh, one thing I wasn't going to mention until I actually did it is uh, the whole issue with the line break. I love the line break now. I'm totally in love with it. But because I'm still not used to reading line breaks. And even in my own work, actually reading it tends to throw me. So I do them by heart, which is terrifying. Um, but I'm getting more used to it. So we'll see how uh, that goes as well. Um, this one. Oh, another thing about poetry is... I found that writing poetry has allowed me to do something I've never been able to do in short fiction, which is to use my own experience from my own life much more directly. And somehow through the shape of a poem, I'm more comfortable with that. I couldn't do it with short stories at all. So this poem is somewhat autobiographical, and it's called Pulled. Once, early on in my development, some boy took me to a roof to see Orion's belt, the Pleiades. I listened, looked politely where he pointed, but already then I knew. Although he had left the door ajar and I was not yet fully formed, that this had nothing to do with stars, the tug of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so that is autobiographical in that yes, there was a boy in a roof, but actually I wasn't so knowing at the time. <laughs> um, right, this one also slightly autobiographical. You can tell them it's really the pre-poem preamble's not going well. So this one's called Vandalism. Pieces which, when the glass was smashed, slid into the innards of the door, now sing to me of breakages and how a thing once shattered may seem fixed. That was inspired by the time I had my car broken into. <laughs> and now everything is like, everything's raw material for a poem. <laughs> and the guy came to fix the window and he said, um, the window will look fine, but you will hear the rattle of the pieces of glass which have slid into this. In, and every time I shut the door, I can hear them. So I thought, oh, that's a good poem. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to read a few now that I've never read before. Uh, I was inspired by Dirian's reading the other day, which was a fantastic reading, she's not here to hear me say that, when she talked about political poems. And that's not something I think I've ever written consciously, but then I thought I will read you this one. Let's have a look and see where I can find it. This is called Oh My Heart. I listen to a program on the radio about a book about young black men in some American neighborhood. On the run, it's called, the book. And I imagine it's not just those young men, that neighborhood, where police lurk outside the schoolyard. 18-year-old, good student, something we'd pass off as harmless, gets him 12 months, then released, no charge. But school says, can't return, too old too late. One arrest, one life, one year of lessons missed, but something learned. Thank you. Uh, another thing that's happening in my poems and my short stories is I very often use science as inspiration. I've been doing that for years. I have a first degree in maths and physics. And I was really bad at it, really bad. So I, I couldn't have been a scientist, I just didn't have that kind of temperament. But I'm endlessly fascinated by science. And so very often use it as inspiration and regularly read New Scientist, which for any writers in the room is a fantastic source of inspiration. And you can just take it and play with it. And this poem, which I've never read out before either, is inspired by the time I spent, I spent a year as writer in residence in a biochemistry lab. Mm -hmm which was so fantastic, especially because coming from physics, I'd never spent time with people who just 
have all these test tubes and stuff and liquid and they just you know mix it and it rocks and there's all these noises and smells and one of the amazing things about molecular biology now is how much we can see of what's going on in real time and so this is a poem inspired by that and it's called this too is prayer no not some lover's glance a newborn's grin sunset autumn leaves but this green fluorescent protein a molecule borrowed from a jellyfish to turn our cells to glowing dancing laborers we applaud as they go about their daily tasks building inspection maintenance now they have us to witness their every act not just of course benign construction not just of course repair but how much better, though, to see, better to no longer be in darkness. Mm -hmm. Keep an eye on the time. How am I doing? Um, so that's about this amazing molecule called green fluorescent protein, which the biologists <coughs> use to tag cells so that you can watch them under a microscope moving. It's like a film of cells with just... It's just amazing. And now they can do it in all different colours and rainbow colours, which is wonderful. Uh, this is another science one. I'm just pretending really with the pages. It just makes me feel a bit more confident. Um, let's forget that entirely. So this is in, uh, was inspired by an article in New Scientist. And this is called <coughs> Honey. Bears, who when awake are not, become diabetic, it seems, as they hibernate. Scientists think this is what allows them to devour those stores of fat during their long winter sleeps. Do they dream of test tubes and reagents? Is there on the tongue of every sleeping bear the faintest hint growing day by day of sweetness? quickly so this is going to be my final poem and thank you so much all of you for being here who aren't related to me <laughs> um, it's really wonderful and this is just beautiful this book and thank you so much to Pat and Jen and all the judges again and I'll end with this poem which um, thrillingly was in the Irish Examiner was it last week? A couple, couple, couple of weeks ago. Brilliant. And I should say as well, since my dad is here, this poem is fictional. This is not autobiographical at all. And it, it's inspired by a story I heard someone tell at a conference about his own father. And as writers want to do, I stole it. <laughs> and it's called, And What We Know About Time. When it failed to alarm, my father took the clock apart, laid it all out on the kitchen table, while the dog dreamed and snored, we watched him clean every piece, then, breaths held, attempt reassembly. It worked perfectly for the next ten years, which was odd, given the sixteen horological components my father couldn't fit back in. <laughs> they lived out the rest of their days in that kitchen drawer designated for such things. There must have been... Someone, somewhere, now, like my father, like the dog, the kitchen table and that drawer, long gone, who once knew exactly what those 16 parts were for. <laughs> who were the final judges were uh, James Harper, Matthew Sweeney, Leanna Sullivan and Thomas McCarthy. And uh, we had over 200 entries and that kind of <coughs> compare that to receiving about on average 1900 single poems which you receive every year for a single poem competition. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's harder for people to go the full length of manuscript, not, not as many people will enter a chapel competition as they might uh, a single poem competition. Um, Victor Tatler won, 
and he was the first choice of three of the four judges and the second choice of the fourth judge, so there was just no dispute whatsoever uh, about how much his manuscript shone, shone out among the, all, all, you know, all of the entries. Uh, he's far from being a debutante. Uh, he's published a collection with Salt uh, some years ago, which was shortlisted for the Seamus Heaney Centre Prize and won East Anglian Book Awards Poetry Prize. <coughs> he's also won the Cardiff International Poetry Competition, incredibly prestigious <coughs> competition in Scotland's Wig Town Prize. And selection of the poems in this was shortlisted for the huge uh, poetry. <coughs> And um, almost uh, at the same time, simultaneously with this, he's a full length collection uh, published in England as well from Templar called Waiting, Waiting to Tango. A completely different selection of poems, no overlap between the two books. Great. Uh, full time writer, he was previously a Financial Times journalist, still is not. Please welcome. Thank you very much uh, again for, for coming, uh, um, and thank you for boosting the audience. <laughs> uh, uh, and thank you, uh, Patrick, and uh, the Literature Centre uh, for um, uh, for selecting the manuscript. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful honour, and uh, uh, as well the endorsement of such a prestigious panel of uh, of editors and poets. Uh, so that's. All wonderful, so thank you very much there. Um, can you just hear me with this? Is this catching the microphone? Thank you, yes. Um, so before I start, um, one thing I need to say is that uh, when it comes to poetry, I'm a cross-dresser, uh, which means that uh, as often as I write in male voices, I write in female voices or speaking through female characters. And the first poem I'd like to read is, um, is indeed in, in a female voice, although it's uh, in a sort of uncharacteristic guise, and the poem is called Kalashnikov. I am promiscuous and unashamed. My lovers take me to cool rooms where I'm stroked by many hands. I live secretly in the suburbs pampered and spared ordinary chores. My lovers trust me not to let them down. I sleep in strange places, on floors of what were once apartment blocks, amid rubble on the street, cradled in rough arms, waiting for daybreak. I've lain with the corpse of a boy in the back of a burnt out truck. The touch of sweat is all my lovers leave. At night they're led to empty cellars where they give their bodies to pain. I've seen them kneel in narrow alleys, murmuring as though at prayer. Such yearnings even I can't satisfy. One afternoon on a hillside I was brought to a fresh grave in the rain. People were mourning a name I'd hardly known, a one-night stand. Set such times I laugh. Head raised, I cackle at the heavens. I feel no loss. Thank you. Well, um, a number of the poems uh, in, the, uh, in the chat book uh, have an Eastern or Asian uh, flavour to them. Uh, it's it's a part of the world I've been lucky enough to to visit a number of times, and particularly China. I I worked in China for a few months uh, during the period when it was still in the process of uh, of the country of opening up, and uh, it, uh, it was still a time when you could see here and there people still walking around in their Chairman Mao suits, and uh, perhaps it was me, but they always some, somehow seem bewildered by the pace of change and the, the nature of the change going on around them. 
But I was also fascinated by uh, seeing similar people, how much life they lived outdoors, social activity, in the parks, on the street side, playing board games, checkers and whatever else, mahjong perhaps, and, and doing their Tai Chi in the early mornings, often in the bitter cold, worse, worse winters even than Ireland. And, uh, and also the singers that would congregate at the weekends in a place called the Temple of Heaven. They had long walkways where uh, uh, these people would gather and I think it must have had some sort of uh, acoustic quality to them. And so this poem is called Temple of Heaven. Saturday afternoon and the amateur opera singers gathering groups along the painted cloisters. Beijing's breezes are out too, a dry Mongolian wind and sleet of dust, clogging the contact lenses that trouble the diva as she steps forward to perform. She brushes her white weekend blouse. The tenor, straightening the collar of his scuffed suit, unfolds his song sheet and glances at the soprano. She nods. He starts. Accordions, flutes, harmonicas, hand drums all find a way to enter the stuttered harmony. A Mozart lilt, Verdi aria, a Cantonese song from a time before the land was drenched in revolution. The days before they saw their teachers sent to pick stones from furrows to boil bark. Sitting on a bench, an old man peels an apple and wipes his penknife, ignoring the accordion's quick, free notes. Um, the, the poems uh, do backpack their way around the world, really, in this, uh, in this chapbook collection. Uh, and the, um, the, next, the next poem is set in the Australian bush. And while the landscape provides the imagery uh, to the poem, uh, uh, to me somehow it's, it's metaphorically, it's a metaphorical expression of isolation uh, and estrangement, and it's called Outback. The desert comes right down to the sea here, where coral spreads its arms in the clear water. I thought its fingers would be many coloured, but they're blotched and brown like seaweed that stiffened in the tide. Some people say this place is close to paradise, though sand flies drink with a passion from my pores, and when the wind gets up, I walk blind against the dust. Everything keeps its own hours. Some mornings I sit on the rocks and watch young sh sharks circling in their nursery offshore, wondering how they judge when it's time to leave for darker waters. Scorpions smile under spinifex, and spiders lie in wait with their love bites. Towards noon, the ground gets hot, and lizards skid across stones in search of shelter. When the sun goes lower, the earth is still fearful of the shadows of eagles. Last night, I looked up at the sky where once, in our safer world, you showed me the runes of Orion. Other stars are strewn there now, and I have a whole galaxy to decipher. Well, um, Invariably, I write in persona using characters that are either uh, completely fictional or uh, just as often, or even more often, ones that are drawn from history. And um, the, next, the next poem is one of those, and it's about China's uh, Empress Dowager Su uh, who was um, effectively the ruler of China for about 50 years, um, uh, certainly the power behind the throne, uh, and uh, she was uh, a 
a, a woman known for her excesses. She was. She did. We're talking about the last half of the 19th century here. So she was a, a sort of close uh, contemporary to Queen Victoria, and um, she was a woman known for her excesses. And so she she would when she was staying at the uh, the Summer Palace just outside Beijing, she would. Uh, uh, take her meals in her residence there in the Hall of Happiness and Longevity mm. and uh, where she was uh, uh, at, uh, where she was served by teams of eunuchs and uh, uh, I, I've read somewhere that uh, on occasion she had 500 eunuchs in, a, in attendance and I, I don't know whether to believe that or not because he, even for an empress that seems an awful lot of eunuchs <laughs> Um, but anyway, the poem is called The Banquet in the Hall of Happiness. <coughs> they listen to the click of my silver chopsticks on the porcelain plate. No one dares to speak. Each supper they bring me the kitchen's riches. Tonight I've eaten nothing but hyacinth beans. These mirrored screens, my only guests. Once... I was the Lady Yehanara, concubine to a god. <coughs> now, forbidden by rank to smile, a dowager with starched face and waxen hair, a woman made Buddha, too precious to touch. Later, when the maids change my gown for my evening walk in the marigold garden, I'll feel each fingertip of their white lace gloves a hundred buttons being undone, sleeves slipped from my arms, silk falling. On the table before me, dishes for a dynasty, sauce of bear's paw, hummingbird wings, cakes of a thousand flowers. I peel an iced lychee for its scent, its flesh full, its skin red as a berry. And just staying with uh, uh, something of China's, China's history for a moment, um, uh, going back uh, a, a century or two to the early 1700s when uh, one of the emperors, or before he became emperor, Prince Xin Zhen, who uh, commissioned a series of paintings uh, showing himself, uh, depicting him toiling, toiling in the fields like a, a, a peasant. And... Um, to me, this seemed re a, 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 an exercise in artful propaganda, really. So, I suppose, politically, uh, not so much changes, really. And this is called Pictures from the Forbidden City. Dawn poppies sprout along the edge of every irrigation ditch, waving their flags like crowds in the street on Coronation Day. Across the valley, wind like war, the stripped has stripped the hillside bare of trees. An army of rice plants raises a million spears above the drowned land. So often the crop is flattened by rain, villages murmur hunger. Spade and sword have shaped these terraces and pathways, the graded banks still pools where every stem, each ripening head, has its place. I dip the ladle in the wooden pail and pour the mix of watery dung. This is how the people must know their emperor, back bent with peasants, up to his knees in the flooded fields, while he alone sees the snakes that swim among roots, their dark bodies twining the stalks. Uh, the, uh, I'm coming to the last two or three poems here, well, three. Uh, two of them, uh, the, the next two, both are about, in their different ways, about relationships that um, have perhaps passed the first throes of love. Uh, and the, the, the first of them is called Holiday Cottage, um, and uh, it brings us a bit close to home, actually. This has more of a Mediterranean feel about it. Um, Holiday Cottage. 
You always loved that ferry ride between, between the islands. Sun leaching months of toxins. Wind licking our skin. The boat's tattered awning flapping a wing to break free. The garden when we got there was often neglected and the lemons flecked with a worsening blight though the leaves still held their sharp tang of citrus. A date palm sown years before fed a whole ecosystem. Sparrows picking through grass for rotted fruit. Ants dismantling the shriveled cocoons to drain traces of sugar. Over time we walked a map of the terrain. Afternoons stumbling on goat tracks over rocky hills and paths the feral cats made through olive groves. Each year, more stucco had crumbled from the walls of the house, and the shutters drooped on their hinges. But still we went back, even when one of us was struggling to break free. Um, so the second of those um, the poems is, um, th this is a relationship that, uh, uh, which forms the, uh, the undercurrent or the subtext of, of the poem, uh, which perhaps unlike the previous one, does have a bit of a chance of being repairable. Uh, and it's called Dead Sea. After breakfast, we go out to the sunbeds by the shore, where we base our bodies in mud. Scrape the skin with bromine and sulphur that seep into old aches and abrasions more recent and unhealed. Both of us questioning therapy as a state of mind. Cradled in the water, our bodies lift, mummified and drifting. We're at the world's lowest point. It was something of a journey through the mountains to get here, hairpin bends with no room to pass, and on the road down through the rift valley, my head seemed squeezed as the atmospheric pressure rose. Now pillowed on a towel, one senses a certain morning peace, if strange without seabirds. This tideless waste they've learned, breeds neither fish nor weed, though the gleam can trick migrating flocks into stopping for the cruelest drink. All day heat shimmers off the hills, distilling the silence until dusk, when we dine on the terrace to cries of foxes and jackals, hunting rock rabbits in scrub. Life is sparse, and only the hardiest plants survive. Caper bushes apply a lotion of wax to deflect rays that bleach and sear. There's a shrub called Rose of Jericho that stretches awake when the soil moistens, so its seeds are borne downwind to find cracks in gullies for new roots. And Shulamit's hair makes its home in the spray of waterfalls after rain. That's when the wilderness fruits and the sea's face is flushed as bacteria bloom. The desert's mood brightens, wadis rush, and the Jordan tamarisk in the garden of the spa where we walk is greener, at least for a time. And finally, uh, a short poem to, uh, uh, to end. And um, just once again to thank you all for coming and to Patrick and the Literature Centre. Um, uh, this one, if it, uh, if it doesn't stretch the imagination too far, is in the voice of a young woman, uh, a waitress. And I would just say it was, it was written and published in a, a couple of anthologies, actually, uh, before smoking was banned in public places. Uh, and it's called Coffee Shop. Most evenings he comes in about this time. Espresso, cigarette, an intelligent paper, a seat by the window, 
facing in. Jeans, jumper and black brogues. I like those. I wipe the table, sometimes twice. When I lean over with his cup, my apron tightens, just a touch. Most evenings, he comes in about this time. I always think he won't, and then he does. <laughs> Accepting entries for the competition again beginning the end, before the end of this month and uh, the deadline will be the end of May. This year's chat books are for sale over there at Fiverr and poets are from England so this could be your only chance to get the book signed. Thanks very much for coming.